Hello, welcome back to another episode of the Always Way podcast. I'm your host, Emma. And I'm your co-host, Dom. And this is the podcast where we talk about travel. Always. Always. So, it's our <laughs> third episode. Apologies, last week we didn't manage to get an episode out, did we? Yeah, because... yeah truth be told, we filmed two episodes and then we got it on to the screen to edit. And one, we just looked really tired in the Two, we looked really unflattering in the angle and the way we'd filmed it was really bad and the audio was also off so we were just like do you know what maybe it's not Never meant to mind. be <laughs> but instead what we did was we waited if you're watching this podcast you'll be able to see that our backdrop has changed a little bit hasn't yeah, it yeah we moved stuff around we bought two armchairs because the chairs that we were filming on before that came with the house they're really ugly and uncomfortable so we've I see, I Hopefully think, it looks slightly better. I mean, I it's not exactly that, groundbreaking, but... Well, Dom found this on Airlight um, to give it a bit of... That professional... <laughs> batan- but yeah, Emma's like, oh yeah, we just bought some armchairs. There's a bit more to it than that. We've got two armchairs. We've got we've a rug that you can't see. got a rug. But uh, it's very uh, nice table. on my feet. We've got microphone stands. Oh yeah, we've- Dom found microphone stands. So now the microphone's on a stand. Hopefully the audio will be a bit better. We've, we've been playing around with it all. And we've got three light boxes in the background that you can't yeah. see. So yeah, there's a little bit more than two armchairs. Emma's really she she's not acting a saleswoman. I turn it down because it's like it sounds like we've done a lot, but well we have, we've done a lot, but I don't know if it Emma's, looks that good. Yet. Emma's ashamed of saying we put some I mean, effort in. Yeah, uh, because well, it we doesn't, just we just bought some chairs because you know. I don't know if it actually looks any good. I mean, it definitely looks better than it did because we just used the old desk that was in this room. Yeah, um, oh, and, that we had and that, it was very uncomfortable. Had fun with that trying to get that out of the room. Made a <laughs> ton and all. anyway. So, yeah, so episode three of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, episode three of the podcast. It felt fitting to talk about our motorbike experiences or moped experiences because we just done the Mayhon Song loop uh, on a motorbike and driven around the whole province of Mayhon Song, if you've seen the series. So, if anyone doesn't know what Mayhon Song is, it, the Mayhon Song loop is a route which is primarily made of the 108 road which loops around the whole of the Mayhong Song province, mm-hmm. hence its name. It's around... Uh, see, it's, there's a mixture of... Because there's different ways that you can go, but it's roughly around 600 kilometres. I think kilometers. the original route is 600 kilometres, and we did the original route. But the thing is, the last day, is the road is really rubbish. So a lot of people don't go the final sort of bit of the loop, and they cut across Doi Inton on the National Park, uh, which we wish we had done, but we didn't have enough time. As you come round, we were recommended to go Doyen to Nomre because the road's a lot better and the hotel yeah. owner recommended it. But then technically it's not the Mei Hong Song loop. So I've, and we've made booking arrangements already. So I thought, you know what? We'll stick to it. Let's stick to the route. And the last route, and like by, the road really does get bad. Yeah, he wasn't joking. Um, yeah, there's a really bad pothole. It was like collapsed bits of the road into yeah. the mount, like the yeah, part, gorges below. Yeah, part of the whole road had collapsed. I couldn't believe that. It was like... yeah. It something was, out of a, like I a movie. We should have filmed it, but it was really hard to film on the bike, and that's one regret that I have of doing the Mayhon song, that we weren't able to really yeah. try it. We weren't really able to film us on the bike. Yeah, we want to invest in like an action cam, so like a new... Uh, like a GoPro or... Uh, hero, like the new DJI Hero, yeah. or there's a new 360 camera that looks good, but again, it all costs it's money. They're, they're so expensive. So we've, we mainly we're mainly trying film to on save a, up for that. Yeah, we mainly film on a DSLR and like trying to film on a motorbike with a DSLR is not the best. We do have an Osmo Pocket, which we've had for years, but yeah, it it's doesn't, a bit, nah. it's not that great anymore. But we did the drone a little bit and the, that was really difficult. <laughs> trying to fly the drone was really frustrating, especially when we were trying to drive on the bike because there wasn't really anywhere to pull over. And I mean, yeah. That's one of my regrets. But <laughs> riding a bike anywhere, but especially Thailand, it definitely makes a difference in comparison to uh, driving a car because I don't know you feel more immersed. You feel like you're mm. more present within your environment being on a bike. But at the same time, given that we just about escaped the worst of burning season before it kicked in, but I'm glad we did it when we did because we literally lucky, yeah. two days later, it's, it was horrific. It's done a huge 360 on in terms of air quality, the smoke, and it just it does it does ruin your experience. Yeah. I, I'm glad we did it, but I wouldn't want to be doing it now. I mean, it even way. when we did it, there was a lot of smoke, and it especially on the last sort of 
half, like second half of it, it was really, really bad. But I mean, it was nothing compared to what it is right now. It feels like we're prisoners in our own home. It's like COVID times basically right now, but the air is still bad in the house. We've got this air purifier, but when you go on the app, it says that the air is severe inside the house. And uh, I don't think because of the price of it, I don't, and the size of it, it doesn't cover that much of many square meters. So I think the rooms we're putting it in are probably above the capacity that it's meant to purify there. Yeah, because downstairs is open plan, so we don't yeah. know how well it does it down there. And there's some gaps in the doors as well. Yeah, we, it uh, says it's used about 50% of the filter. Yeah, but he's yeah. down here at the moment. I don't know if you want to hold yeah, him up. He's, the, he's uh, got a little face on him. You can't, I don't think you can see him. But he, he does a smiley face when the air's good. And I haven't seen a smiley face <laughs> He has for a, a while. smile for a while, a bit like <laughs> me. So... <laughs> But yeah, it's a bit like being back in COVID. It's quite yeah. depressing. The air is like going outside and seeing the sky. It's always been blue skies, like the whole six mm. months we've been here. And then this last month, it's just everyday grey and really apocalyptic and yeah. horrible. Chiang Mai is a completely different place uh, uh, from mm. three weeks ago even t- to now. And, you know, it's not just foreigners like us you know, complaining, Thai people are constantly on the groups, like saying all these taxes we pay and they can't sort this out, like it's a joke. And, you know, it, you know, it's not great. Something needs to be done about it, but whether it will or not and when it will be is another mm. question. But right now, we've, like most people in Chiang Mai, a lot of people who are privileged enough can just leave. But most people like us have commitments and, you know, upping and leaving your home and, going on a hotel for a month we've got the dog yeah and down in the south there is a heat wave and it's nearly 50 degrees so Mm. it's like you can't win anywhere right now it's it's really not good and what's funny is it's high season and there's a there are a lot of tourists in the town center here and like bugger that like i can't imagine i can't imagine coming on holiday at this time it's really really horrible Chiang Mai is such a lovely place but right now it's just it's just like a totally different place. And my observation of people that you see walking around that are clearly tourists, they literally have no idea. Yeah, I they think just think this know. is this is what it's like all the time. But it really isn't. Yeah. But right now it is the most polluted city in the world, which is just horrible. Like why do we just <laughs> <laughs> you know when you see it's above like India and China and like big yeah. cities and you're seeing Chiang Mai at the top of the list, it's it's crazy to think. Yeah. But it's quite scary to read about as well. No. But I mean, I'm fed up of talking about it. I wish it would just go away, but... Well, it will be in the next month or two, but... You it's know, still a way to still go. Still got a while to go. And it just feels like it's getting worse and worse every single day. So this episode is mainly going to be talking about our riding and driving experiences in different um, countries. Now, we're currently in Thailand, living in Thailand at the moment, if you didn't know that already. And now, if you didn't know, when you have... UK if you're from the UK that is or US or you know anywhere you have a you know your license that's in your country which gives you the right to drive or ride in your country but if you want to travel abroad outside of your home country you need to get what's known as an international driving permit which is basically like a little book a little piece of paper which has a photo of you in it and your local authority in your home country will stamp it to it's like a translation in different languages of what entitlement you have on your license. But yeah, so if you want to drive abroad, please get your international driving permit in your, in your, home, country. In your home country. Yeah. Now in the UK, it costs us five, I think it was five pounds. Five pounds and you just go to the post um, office. Yeah, so if you're in the UK, you can go to the post office. And it's really quick and easy. It, you know, you just have a passport photo, they check your license, they have the special stamp. But I mean, for us now living here, we don't need that driving permit anymore. So it's like we we didn't have bike licenses in the UK. Um, our license only allows us to drive cars, but we did the bike test here. And like Dom said, you can get the international driving permit or whatever it is yeah, here so to as ride a resident a bike. of Thailand. Yeah. So for like a year, we could drive a giant motorbike back in the UK. It, which I mean, that is quite really, scary. I'm surprised that you can like do that but um, given the test that i i did here to get my license originally it's super easy it's yeah it's not in, in some the uk other countries. you only get one year but i mean yeah. you could drive in japan which like that's probably a dream to do a, like a motorbike Big trip bike across trip. japan i was looking into it but again it's quite expensive, so expensive uh, yeah. to rent a bike but yeah that'd be something i'd like to do i think right like anywhere 
driving is you know every country has their quirks thailand's no different uh, thailand's probably got the most dangerous roads yeah. in, on the, if you're in gonna, the world if you're gonna be if you're gonna get injured in thailand you're right. gonna get injured on the road most likely yeah and that could be in a car but of course it's most likely on a bike so you have to have your wits about you but it does surprise me how many people come to a country like thailand they've never been on a bike in their life not even a moped like we've had mopeds in the uk so you get a little bit of experience on that just road placement and <coughs> handling a bike but some people just come here and like first time s- on a bike no uh, t-shirt and then i no see and you've got people on tiktok if this is one guy he's going oh it's like thailand's like gta 4 5 like you can you can rent anything you like you can do what you like and you're supposed to have a license but they don't check you don't it. need one like, but it's like well really I, you do you should be following the rules it's like time. okay i get your point maybe there are companies that aren't too fast that you don't have and they won't ask to see your license intentionally because they know you haven't got one but it does also mean you are liable if you crash that bike but people, you only get to see that side of Thailand or that side of it when you crash, when you're plus, unfortunate enough to crash it. Plus, it invalidates your travel insurance. So if you do get injured, you're absolutely buggered. Unless and you've it, got loads of money, then yeah. you can just pay. But most people don't, especially that are coming to Thailand. There's a lot more budget conscious travelers. And that's like the people that we spoke to. They didn't have a huge budget. And we sort of encourage them to say, look, if you have an accident, you know, they could probably wipe out their whole one year budget of travel in that accident to pay hospital fees yeah so, so if you are coming to thailand you want to ride a bike make sure you have a license if you don't have a license in the uk you can try and get one here but i to be honest i don't think you're tourists tourists and if you because you, you you can get one when you have a certificate of residence now it's a bit of a gray area if you can get one as a tourist because i know some people have done but in my opinion i believe if you don't have a license here don't ride a bike unless or a car unless even. you're gonna get a license and i mean we do really love riding on motorbikes but this time coming here we were sort of trying to avoid getting a bike but we were kind of pushed into it when our car broke and that's when we rented a motorbike and it was like five six months into being here this time and normally we've always ridden motorbikes when we come here but um we got a car this time because one with the dog and mostly just safety like yeah and it's more comfortable people, as well, you know. Yeah, you can have air con, listen to the radio, whatever, but... Um, <laughs> Sound like right old pair, <laughs> listen to the radio. But it is nice to have a car here. Yeah, so please, if you come to Thailand or anywhere, where, if you're going to ride a bike, have a license, wear a helmet. Oh, God wear dear. a helmet, yeah, so many people. We, we were coming around a bend the other day and this guy was on the floor with no helmet, with all his stuff everywhere, and the bike was on top of him. And next to him was the taxi driver, the bike taxi driver helping him up. Because here you can have motorbike taxis, but I wouldn't get on one, to be (laughs) honest, especially without a helmet. This guy was so lucky that he didn't crack his head open. And he looked about 14 or something. I mean, I've always, especially like in previous years, I've always used motorbike taxis because they're so cheap. A lot of people I see on the back of the grab motorbike taxis and they're not wearing helmets, they're... Yeah. I, I couldn't imagine getting on a bike without a helmet. I'm too, too like, nervous. I've seen this People girl on look TikTok. cool. They look cool on the back. Yeah, it's Whoa. all nice and easy, but, <laughs> like, like, it's not that sweaty wearing a helmet. And, and you get over it after five minutes. You get like, over it pretty quickly. Plus, you also get stuff in your eyes. Yeah. Especially right now with all this, like, That's horrible you, You've got to have your shades on. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, yeah, don't so... Don't get on a bike with no helmet. This woman I saw on TikTok, she was in Bali and she witnessed someone come off a bike and she, she was like crying in the video saying that she'd seen them come off the bike with no helmet and their head just was like a watermelon. Yeah. And like, I, I do not want to see that. I also read recently, there was an article in the BBC that a uh, husband and wife rented a bike uh, recently and he's actually now, he had an accident and he said he'd come off at around 20 miles an hour, but he has since become paralysed and he said in the, I'm not sure the exact, context of the accident but his wife was okay but he is now paralyzed from the waist down and he said i would probably be dead if i didn't have a helmet on he didn't even come off at high speed so every time we get on a bike i do worry because people think oh if you're in chiang mai there's a lot of traffic and there is and you're weaving in and out but you know you can still have if you're if you hit your head on the street walking down the road let alone when you're on a bike you know it but yeah, like a friend of my dad's was studying in Thailand. He was at university in Bangkok and he's quite an, ex- he's an experienced rider and he's been in Thailand, you know, 10, over 10, well, five. 
he'd been in Thailand around five years at that point. So he's very familiar with Thailand, familiar with the roads, and he had bike experience. And he was just at a junction one day waiting um, for the lights. And next next minute, it was around seven in the morning on his way to university. And the next minute, he woke up in hospital. And he had this awful... He had serious injuries and he had this awful noise in his head that it just wouldn't go. Like 24, a 24 hour, like a really high pitched ringing and it, and, it's, and it nearly drove him mad. And I think, you know, he was contemplating all sorts of things because it was, it was just, imagine that 24 Too seven and the doctors couldn't work out what was causing it and they couldn't treat it and there was nothing really they could do. Now, luckily for him, one day it just stopped and he's now managed to, you know, recover and live a normal life again. For myself, I've had one accident in Thailand, and that was my, my first motorbike accident. Was and only motorbike accident was in a province around an hour from Bangkok. At that time, I was actually living in Thailand as a English teacher at 16 years old. Now that's a different story, which I will be doing a whole episode on that. But anyway, I was cu- I've done a quick run to McDonald's, and this was before sort of the grab grana- the grab phenomenon. It was just getting started back then. And on the way back, I was just driving past this quite popular nightclub in the area. And just going driving past it, I was just coming up to my right turn to drive back to my condo. And literally, I'm waiting. I can see this car coming towards me. So I'm waiting for that car to go by. And then I was about to turn. But then just as the car was just coming past me, I hear this really loud, like sound like a gunshot. But it was this one of these snazzy tailpipe, you know, exhaust, the sports exhaust or whatever it was. And it sounded like a rocket. And it literally just flew by me. But as it flew by me, it hit my bike. The only way I can describe it, it was like a f- someone chipping a football. So it hit the back of my bike and I just sort of pinged in the air. And everything sort of went slow motion and it was all very weird. And I remember thinking when I was at the highest point in the air and as I was about to come back down thinking... I'm not going to make this. I don't think I'm going to get out of this one. Because at that point, I think I thought the, ca- the car was going to, another car was going to hit me as I, f- as I come down. But as I fell on the floor, I was fine. And I literally just got back up like I just slipped over. I had a helmet on, obviously. And I remember all these, there was people sitting at the local shops, like getting drunk, all these women and a couple of guys. And they come running over to help me saying, oh, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. And they're all just shocked how I didn't have a mark. I didn't have a scratch, nothing. And they was like, are you going to report it to the police? Because it turns out this person was quite a well-known, I don't know, criminal or one of the mafia types in Thailand. And they were saying, you know, you should, you know, you should report it. Could have killed you, kind of thing. But knowing Thailand, someone like that, I had no scratches on me. The bike wasn't even damaged, really, just scratched. And the bike was quite an old bike, anyway. So did they hit the back point? Of they the bike? hit the back of it and just carried on. And just carried on, didn't stop. No. And it's weird because the bike didn't really have any damage. I think the back. I had to replace a back panel, and that cost like thirty pounds. So it inconvenienced me, but. And, you know, I could have took that. I, I mean, I kind of did. And I thought, oh, maybe I shouldn't ride a bike here. But around that time, I didn't really have any other choice. So I was carried on riding the bike. Riding a bike here, it's, you know, it's like it's a love and hate relationship for me. So I love riding a bike. But then you do have to think about the consequence of what could happen riding Yeah, well, here. I mean, in both those stories, neither of you were even riding. You just sit. Yeah, I was stationary. Stationary, same both same, of yeah. you. And you've been here. Driving in Thailand, I wouldn't feel comfortable riding a, a motorbike. I got a license, obviously, just sort of for the sake of it. But I used to have a moped back in the UK. When we were both 16, 17, we, we had mopeds. And I mean, mine was really slow. <laughs> it was this 50cc, really tiny bike, really light. Peugeot? Yeah, little Peugeot. Oh, I don't thing. know what they call them. Zip? Is Peugeot it? Click. Click. Was click. It a, no, it wasn't a click. It was a click. Was it? Oh. Yeah, but it was it was a really tiny light one because once I tried driving on Dom's bike and it was so heavy for me that I, I dropped it trying to get on it. <laughs> yeah, my pristine, not a mark yeah. on it bike. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I rode this tiny thing and I couldn't go very fast on it. But one day I was coming down a hill, not even a, it wasn't even that much of a big hill, but I was getting a bit more speed and there was a car quite far in front, but suddenly um, he just braked really harshly and didn't indicate that he was going to turn right uh, so he just sort of 
braked really suddenly in the middle of the road and I didn't have enough time to brake behind him coming down the hill. I tried to brake, but I knew I was going to hit the back of his car and I didn't want to hit the back of his car. So I turned and the bike just sort of skidded underneath me. And I mean, he just carried on like normal. I didn't hit him. Uh, but no one no one stopped or anything. Oh, Dom I was did. behind me. <laughs> Dom helped me out. But yeah, it was on a main road and I just came off the bike, sort of skidded across uh. the road along with my bike. I had a helmet on and I was fine, but I had a really bad cut all up my my foot and my leg that went like green. I don't know if you remember. I have a, a history with green, green feet. infected cuts. But it's, up my legs uh, and my it still surprised me to this day how no one stopped and no one gave a crap <laughs> like that yeah. you were just on the floor and it wasn't a serious accident but even so it was just weird to to yeah there was loads of people driving around me <laughs> like and just overtaking me on the floor mm. with the bike yeah and, i mean yeah. it seems like yesterday when i took emma to our local community center car park and i taught her how to ride a bike <laughs> yeah in the, in the car park going around because then after that we we did in like the in the uk the compulsory basic training which is, I mean, anyone can pass if you fail that, blimey. But it's literally just riding around. Yeah, it's around quite easy to get like a moped yeah. or whatever back home when but, you're 16. You yeah, can, I've got a very remember. weird story attached to my bike as well because I had it a, a while after that accident, didn't I? Mm-hmm. And one night I went, I went out in Maidstone in Kent in the town centre. Oh yeah. It was sort of a, you know, wasn't planning on going out, but I did. And then I started having a drink in town. So I thought, oh, well, I can't Leave the bike. ride back. So yeah. I, I left it in the car park. And because if you have a bike in Maidstone, there are lots of bike sections in uh, public car parks. And CCTV. And, and so which is like... free parking. And it was all, this, I, picked, I picked this particular one because it was outside the council offices. So all there was loads of CCTV uh, from the office itself and then facing the, the car park. So I thought oh, I'd be safe there. But anyway, I went out for the night and came back the next morning and it was gone and I was like well and I reported it to the police and it turned out that they actually knew where the bike was because they found it um, maybe a mile up the road so basically around 2 3 in the morning these guys have just come out of a club and just hot wired it for a laugh and joyrided it up the road and I didn't have much fuel in it so obviously they're driving quite erratic you know heavy revving I don't know and they've run out of petrol <laughs> so when they've went out and they've just dumped it and i didn't get any call from the police i mean the bike's registered to me there was paperwork in the bike itself which is my insurance documents with my address on they could have easily have found me and in the end i was actually contacted later by the police to tell me that you know where my bike was and they were charged they were to charge me 250 pounds or something something ridiculous because they picked it up off the road and, and they was, were storing it. <laughs> and then they, then they started storing it in the middle of the Isle of Sheppey, which was miles away. And so they wanted, they wanted Dom to pay to retrieve the bike that was stolen from him. Well, yeah, so I not only had to pay the recovery, and then I had to pay for their storage fees at like £50 a day. And, and I was having back and forth with Kent Police and the, I don't know, some management, co- uh, it's like a recovery company. And in the end, they ended up scrapping my bike because I didn't pick it up within like a week. Or something because I was still like trying to trying to find out where find out it. where how to get it because they said oh it's on the Isle of Sheppey didn't give me an address there was multiple warehouses that it could have been at on the island you know just completely r- wrote off my bike and I don't think the insurance wanted to pay out on it and I wasn't willing to take a claim for something that wasn't my fault and in the end my sister actually got a phone call with like the police officer in charge of it and they decided to make me an offer out of court. And basically, they paid the full mark. I think full market value of the bike plus loss of earnings because I couldn't go to work because I didn't have the bike. It in the end, worked it worked out, out but, okay, but, but still the fact of stressful. them just scrapping it without telling you and and having to gather all this evidence, trying to charge you to get the yeah. bike and not even telling you where it was. I mean, to have to pay nearly three hundred pounds to retrieve For a stolen bike. motorbike. Yeah, but a bike. This is what and. I, and Literally, it doesn't the, take up much they, room. Because they had to send photos of it cause it, to confirm it was my bike and things like that prior to them scrapping it. And you could see there was nothing wrong with it. And they didn't even. And they got this huge tray, like pickup tray, to come get it. And it's like, you I, could if have you'd just have just, picked it up. if you'd have just phoned me, and t- the bike was tax insured, MOT'd, completely road legal, you could have just left it on the road, and I'd have come and collected it. Whereas my bike just went wrong when I was washing it. <laughs> I washed it a bit too 
a bit well, too far up. and the water must have got in it somehow because I literally washed it and then it wouldn't start again. <laughs> so that was the end of my bike. Uh, I think we used to ride them for like a year, maybe like a year and a half. We were using them two years. Yeah, so we, you know, you, it's very different riding a big bike to a moped, but mine was like heavily tuned up. I had a sports exhaust on it and all kinds of things to make it go. Yeah, Dom's, Dom's went faster than mine, that's for sure. But since I came off the bike, I mean, I did get straight back on it. And because I, I lived kind of rural, I needed it to get to work and just like to get anywhere, basically. Because there was a little bus service that ran like three times a fucking day. But, yeah, um, three times better <laughs> now. It's once a day. Yeah, they've literally yeah. scrapped the bus now. So I needed the moped to get anywhere, basically. But um, And Emma was working in pubs at the time, so she was finishing at like 4 a.m. 3 in the morning. And I remember like just being freezing coming out of the coming out of work and just, yeah. just like and zipping I, up the road. I remember, one time, I remember one time Emma was working for this guy who ran a pub and he was a bit... He was a, he was a character, should we say. And one night she she was working there and it was basically him and all his friends used to just sit in this pub and Emma was working there yeah. and one night Emma got drunk no well he the thing is he'd made his own moonshine <laughs> and he was just encouraging me to try it and I was like but I need to drive home and he was like no yeah, leave it here and in the end I, I ended up trying this drink and he like ordered pizza and we had a drink or whatever and he uh, got someone to I no, think I Dom remember, came I to was pick, get me. I was picking. I had to pick Emma up because she was like, "Oh, um, she rang me up drunk. Oh, I'm too drunk to drive." And and when I come back, <laughs> too drunk to drive. Yeah, too drunk. And well, then I wouldn't. I even with like. Yeah, and yeah, I she. Had, I would never drink. I turned up at the pub, and there's this the the owners there with his friends. They're all drunk out their head. He's got a Saint Bernard like as big as a bear, and, and he's then Geordie. That, and he's yeah, he's Geordie, and, and then he's got these Geordie two Geordie guys. Geordie. Push him through Emma's moped through his pub. No, I think he he got he got on it and rode it into the pub. Yeah, he, so he rode it into the <laughs> into pub. Into his own pub. And like he just drove mo- my moped through it into his the, garden. Nearly running over his St. Bernard. I guess it's private property. And this St. Bernard was like, it was so big. And for some reason, it, I don't know why, it didn't, didn't like, like black jackets. Yeah, he didn't he like said. anyone dressed in black. And I had a black leather jacket and on. And he was massive. And when I turned up, he, he sort of like got on his two legs and stood up as tall as me and then he started going and I was like oh no i got to take my head off <laughs> dribble everywhere yeah, dribbling well. everywhere yeah so we've had quite some experiences with bikes and yeah, mopeds but because I, I came off like I don't feel that um, confident on especially the bigger bikes here like they're a lot heavier than the one I had I had a really light one and uh, yeah I tried a little bit I tried to drive up the road on the one we rented and it's the turns that I get scared I'm going to come off because I came off when I was turning. So it's like every oh. time we go around the Even bed, as a I'm passenger, scared like, it's going to fly out from underneath Bearing me. in mind, so the Mei Hong Song loop we just did is how many bends is it? <laughs> 1,800. 1,800 bends. And the first, and the first 800 Tepai, of those... Tepai, there's the way, 500. 500. And that's the first leg. On the way to buy. So I'm like, you know, getting all fancy. I'm weaving in and out. I'm giving it all that. And Emma's like holding on for dear life. Like I'm... I don't know, like I'm driving dangerously, but I'm just because Dom doing the Because Dom likes to lean more than I would lean. Yeah, r- <laughs> well, riding the bike correctly. <laughs> well, yeah, but I always get scared that it's just going to sort of come also, skid on. Also, what Emma seems up. to forget is like the bike or the moped she had was this little tiny, like... It's probably the smallest short, sort of thing Smallest thing you, thing you can have. And we were on a 100... We were only on a 160. Um, but it's a, the bike's a lot bigger, uh, an M-Max. And... You have to give it a bit more because it's got more weight to it. I mean, it's two people on it as well, so you need to, you know. And in Thailand, you really have to be careful, especially on that Mae Hong Song loop, because there's so many bends. People, a lot of drivers here just don't seem to understand road placement. So they'll openly come around a bend on the wrong side of the road and not think nothing of it. And also overtaking on bends. And they overtake. They overtake on the most dangerous parts Basically, of the it's road. like they pick the worst point you could yeah. overtake and then that's when they'll overtake. So you have to worry that someone's going to come around the corner and they're going to be on your side of the road and you're going to have to swerve it. And we um, did have sort of a near miss with a, a truck. Trying to overtake us. Overtaking another minibus on a bend and I had to, we- I had to dodge it. So, but luckily... Because when I'm on a bike, even when I'm driving a car, in Thailand, the most stupidest thing you can think of that a driver's going to do, they normally do it. So, yeah. like, I normally... Now, I don't even... Like, in the UK, if you were driving and people did certain things, like, cut across you... To or, be honest, you even just, in the like, UK, I, no, but 
I imagine that they're going to do the worst that they're going to do. Yeah, I know. But, but here, here, it, here it's it normally there's does no, happen. There's no comparison. Like, no, if you was in the UK, you'd be back home, people would be screaming. Oh, yeah. Ultra roll rage. Road but here, rage. I don't even blink You don't really see road rage in the same way as um, back home. For example, we've seen one really bad case of road rage, which yeah. is the... Just when we were in the White Temple. Yeah, when one day we went on a minibus tour to Chiang Rai, which is about a three-hour drive from here. It's a really nice place. They've got the White Temple, which is really famous. It's near the border of Laos and Burma, so it's got the, the Golden Triangle River. And, uh, yeah, we were going on a day trip there, and we'd done it. We were coming back, and we were in traffic in the town of in like the main center of Chiang Rai. We were going down this really busy main road and our driver cut up a guy in a big white Porsche, which the Porsche wasn't happy about. And we could see him sort of like next to the car trying to like argue and shout at the driver. Right, wasn't but it? we were moving kind of at low speed. So yeah, really it, low we speed. was coming up to like quite a big four way junction and they were sort of arguing amongst themselves, shouting at each other in Thai. And then suddenly I looked over and the guy unwound his window and then pulled out a gun and pointed it at the car. And he was sort of waving it around. So I naturally was like, right, I'm getting down the floor. I alert everyone else in the vehicle to get on the floor because there's a bloke pointing a gun at our minibus. And laughing like a yeah, like maniac. A, like a psycho. It was terrifying. But no one else saw it. We're on this bus full of like, Spanish they're French, people. No, they were French, were they? Uh, I think there was oh, some Spanish. French, but mainly so Spanish. Half a Spanish, half... Half a Spanish, half a French and half a Spanish, but they had there there was was a few kids on the there bus. There was children on the bus. And they all looked at me like I was mad. Because they didn't see it. But we're literally looking out the window at this man going, ha, 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 and like but waving his gun at us. Luckily, a police car just comes up from the, approaches the junction on the other side and the guy spots it and he just undoes, he whizzes his window up and off he goes. So that was sort of our... Don't get that sh- was probably the only time I've ever felt unsafe in Thailand. Like Thailand is really safe for traveling, especially like it, as a as a female, I would happily solo travel Thailand. It's the one country I've never felt unsafe apart from that gun incident, but that wasn't necessarily towards us, but I don't think he could even see us through the tint on the window, no, but that's the thing because the windows are heavily tinted, he wouldn't have known how many people were even in that minibus. But the fact of it is it was a branded tour company. Yeah. So he could guess, you know, that there's passengers in there. But then you don't know if people especially people here with power, influence and they might be on something you don't know. So you do have to so in that kind of situation you have to assume the worst. Yes. I was messaging people I was texting people like yeah, you This is dad, my location, like, yeah. this is what's happened. If I'm dead, you know why. I was I gave him the number play. I mean, it would have been a ridiculous thing to do to just shoot up a minivan full of tourists. I know, but, you, but if they're on ridiculous. if they're on drugs or you know, that's the thing. There is know. people will take this thing called yabba, which is a Thai version of meth, and well, it's based on methamphetamine, but it's in like tablet form, so they can smoke it, they can you know just pop it. I mean, that face that he pulled was absolutely psychotic. And that scared me as much as the gun. Because he was just laughing while he's just waving this gun at us. And in a really busy main road, it was just really weird But then, scary. it's like, I did think back as well, because in my time when I was teaching here, when I was 16, there was this, I was working for this language centre, and the guy that ran it was dodgy. I mean, you can assume he was dodgy, because he was willing to employ me at 16 with no qualifications. <laughs> Uh, to teach English in schools and private lessons but I was doing my first English camp and on the way to the English camp he's driving like a loony in his Toyota 4x4 like and he just suddenly pulls He we had a bit of road rage incident nothing major he didn't do anything but he just showered at him and just carried on but then he showed me the inside of his door and he just pulls out what appears to be a gun. But then as he's pulled it out and it was a lo- I was on the passenger uh, seat, I could see that it was fake. Did he tell you it was fake? Yeah, and then he then confirmed. He confirmed it was fake. And I was like, why are you carrying it then? He's like, oh, if I have a problem, I can... that It will scare them away. And then it's just... But then what happens if you, if you pull out a fake gun on someone who has a real one <laughs> and then they assume they're in danger? And then he's doing this with me while I'm in the car and I'm like, oh, God, like, what have I signed up for? Mm. And on the way to an English camp where you've got to be all chirpy doing like English activities for young kids and I'm just had this guy who's with me pull some toy gun out and someone. 
But yeah, so that isn't uncommon here. People do seem to carry fake guns in their cars. I mean, that's the only time we've come across it. I mean, mm. you, I mean you with that guy and then us with the yeah. Chiang Mai thing. But, but apart from that, I've never felt, if anything, like whenever I've lost anything, like high value, like laptops, phones, bags, even wallets full of cash, I've always got it back. Yeah. And maybe that's luck. Apart from the one time you... We got off a bus. No, the first day I landed. We've got off a bus a few times and forgotten to get our luggage off the bus. Yeah, it seems to be a um, common thing. But one day we got off the bus, uh, like the big big bus from Bangkok to Pattaya of all places, and Dom got off and we were trying to order a taxi and he's put his bag down with his laptop in it. And yeah, the taxi's come, we've got it in the taxi. But I've left it on the floor because I've it. been on my phone trying to like, organized finding the taxi see where he was and what car he had and all that but i put the i put the bag down but i haven't picked it back up so i've got in the car gone to the hotel and, and i'm realized, like john where's your but, where's your bag but i just left it on the street and i tried i tried someone tracking. found it i tried tracking it it never come to live again so i'm guessing whoever found it sold it to a shop and they've stripped it for parts because it didn't yeah. and wiped it I mean, that wasn't a very hopeful situation because no. we didn't even <laughs> What a stupid thing to do. But <laughs> <laughs> what do you think to do? Well, it was. Oh, really well, I'm sorry. Well, I can name a lot of stupid but, things um, you do as well. Should, should we start naming stupid things? Yes. It's not nice, <laughs> is it? No, but we, Dom has also left a wallet about two or three times on a bus. No, a I've never bus. left a wallet on a bus. Basically, what it is, because as a man, I'm usually, when I'm in Thailand, I'm wearing like these trunks. Short, my little short shorts. I'm wearing like swimming shorts or you know billabong you know type shorts and they're a bit baggy so when you have your wallet in and you're on one of these sleeper buses and for some reason i always end up getting the top bunk i don't know why you know stuff can fall out your pocket and yes my wallet is normally one of those but we haven't been on any mini buses i mean this was years ago years. we haven't gone we haven't gone on one in years but um for example we were flying out of the country to go to vietnam and we'd got the bus to back to bangkok to do it and he left the wallet on the bus back and not realizing until we checked in for our flight and we we're about to go through security and dom's just realized my wallet isn't here shit i've left it on the bus and we managed to ring up the bus company and they brought it straight back yeah they, 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 they sent, sent someone down but yeah it was nice of him you know not one penny but taken or anything and they i don't think they even charged me for the taxi but yeah so they were just helpful but i have also had it happen where i've been on a bus and i've dropped my wallet and i i then realized i've dropped it so like i said i was on the top bunk and i saw this guy and i don't know my impression this was a foreigner i might add he wasn't going to tell me i dropped my wallet and he was going to maybe take the cash out of it or something but i I realised it wasn't there and I was like, hold on, where's my wallet? And the guy didn't say anything for like 10 seconds. Now, 10 seconds doesn't seem long, but actually it's in that kind of moment of me yeah, outright saying, this guy could speak English, you know, and then I, I then proceeded to get off of the bunk and I was like, right, I'm going to have to just start looking. It must be in the bottom bunk. And then suddenly he goes, oh, here it is. And then just hands it to me. It just appears out of nowhere. But well, I think that when you come to Thailand, the main thing you've got to worry about is the other foreigners, especially when you're in a hostel. If you're going to have someone rob you, it will be... Other tourists, basically. Other tourists, that uh, Thai where, people. That's probably more what you've got to worry about, being in hostels. I mean, I've heard so many stories of people getting stuff stolen by mm. other foreigners. But Thai people, like, stealing is a big no-no in Thailand. Um yeah, People it's have a very lot of frowned respect upon. For each other. And they it, would never. Yeah. Well, I mean, it also it's, it's going to happen. It's not just that. It's 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 all about the saving face as well. That mm. it's like be, not only being in a position to have to steal something, but then taking someone else's property. You know, it's it's just it, really really laps. frowned upon. Um, yeah, which is good. <laughs> I feel very safe in Thailand, even with the gun incident. But I mean, that happened a long time ago, and. Nothing like that has ever happened since. No. But in Thailand, it's it's a place where if you don't... Generally, if you don't cause trouble, trouble isn't caused upon you. Yeah. Uh, obviously, that's not in every case because, you know, sometimes things can happen, you know, and there are bad people in the world no matter where you are. And Thailand isn't, you know, it's not exempt from that. But it's just if you're going anywhere, but even Southeast Asia especially... 
you know, and other where cultures are completely different. You just got to be wary of your surroundings. You know, be conscious of what you're doing, and you know, just don't annoy, don't be disrespectful yeah, because be normally that's where it starts. Yeah. But also the thing in Thailand as well, the whole saving th- face thing is gigantic. I'm not sure if it's the whole of Asia. I feel like it's probably a big thing in Asia in general, but in Thailand it's super, super like don't yeah, I mean, shout at people because. They don't want to lose face. Yeah, and I mean, there are laws in Thailand, like the defamation laws, that is strongly linked to saving face. It's literally like the saving face law because the whole thing is that you can't shame someone, a business, a, an individual, in, in a public domain that can affect, that they put their classes affecting their character and their image. So that is literally the definition of saving face is that you don't want to ruin your reputation. Mm. So laws are there literally to protect that and that's why you get a lot of these people you see on tiktok and what they're getting in beef with each other and they're they're in thailand and it's like now they're yeah if you if uh, you've been on tiktok and you've seen birchie and oh, oh, I wasn't gonna name johnny them. oh no you got <laughs> there is a they're lot of a defamation sui, stuff going on each other in thailand because of this defamation law i mean it is ridiculous like literally you could leave a review on a platform like booking.com or you know anything google you can leave a review can we get you, defamed for defaming the defamation law <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know can we get in trouble for I saying love, it's ridiculous? i love i think the defamation law is great <laughs> Maybe we defamation law way. is excellent and it serves its purpose no i but, get i sort of like it's good in one sense that like yeah. someone can't just but then it means you can have a negative experience for example in a restaurant and you, and you can complain it. about it yeah. and then they can say prison you <laughs> are going to prison because you said your pasta was yeah. cold or your service your mum would be buggered because yeah, she likes uh, a bad review yeah um, my mum she she could review the best restaurant in the world and give it one star so and and we seem to have especially in the UK we have, seem to have this whole self entitlement that you can if you have a negative experience in a restaurant or whatever and you, you normally you assume oh well this is coming off my bill uh, or you know you want to be compensated for it in Thailand they just look at you oh, like no. they I just rem- look at you I like I remember seeing when I took your mum to a sushi place in Patia Oh. And she complained there, and she was like, and she was I expecting, want a refund. and she and was expecting like, what you'd off. get in the UK, where it's like, oh, I'm, I'm so, so sorry, sorry, madam. Let me get you something else. We'll take that off your bill. Have a voucher. You know, treat you like God. Yeah, but yeah, then in yeah, Thailand, it, that's like, yeah, yeah, okay. You're, don't expect that. Yeah, you're, basically, the best you're gonna get is, would you like to get another one? And that is sort of luck. Yeah. In Thailand, it's like if you have a negative experience in a restaurant. I Just mean, I I've had a couple of situations where like i've wanted to leave a bad review but you just have to think about that law and how it could affect their business you know so it's just like what sometimes reviews are just pointless in thailand anyway yeah so be aware of that if you come mm. in maybe don't write. also be cautious of you might look at places and they've got no negative reviews but there's yeah. a reason for that i mean i feel like that's everywhere especially in yeah. japan like people go crazy over restaurants and there's queues for an hour and then it's like not nothing, not nothing special. special at all. Yeah. But um, you get that here as well. There's a lot of restaurants the hype. in the Michelin Guide, for example. Uh, and it seems like every restaurant in Thailand is in the Michelin Guide. <laughs> I don't know if there's something going on there. Who knows? I think there's but just a lot of good food in There's Thailand. a lot of good food in Thailand, which is the right answer. But it is true, though. I, like, the food is really good. In and you get queues and queues for place, certain places all day, every day. And in this heat, in this, uh, no, thank you. I'd rather just <laughs> wait. Like I, I went to a restaurant. It's a cow soy. In, it's called cow soy Niman. Did you in actually Niman. go? I went there and I, I went there and it was dead, right? But this was, I guess, it was just coming into high season, so it's still low season. But then we've, I went to take Emma there, and we've drove by there, and it's queues out the door. Every time we go, it's just there, like it's just non-stop. The uh, so we haven't managed to go there, but it's like a two pounds, two to three dollar meal. For a Michelin guide, and you get some. Is it Michelin guide or is it Mich- Michelin guide? Oh, because there's, there's most, so many most Michelin res- guide places. Most restaurants are in the Michelin guide, right, in Thailand, or part of Thailand's Michelin guide. But you get people again on TikTok. They're like, I'm going to a Michelin star uh, street because there are street food vendors yeah. that are in the Michelin guide because their food's so good. But it's not Michelin star. But they're all saying it's Michelin star, and there's a very big difference in that. They're like, oh my guide, god, so I'm, like- I'm living wild. Michelin <laughs> stars from my two pound noodle soup. <laughs> and it's like, well, no, it's in the Michelin Guide because it's good, but it doesn't have a start, unfortunately. Yeah, but there are a lot of places in the Michelin Guide, and they are they are good. The, like, it's not hard to get good food, even if it's 
it doesn't look like it could be in a Michelin guide because yeah, it doesn't look fancy. There are it's still really good food. Um, yeah, I think Thailand ticks all the boxes as a southeast. Like if you're tra- backpacking Southeast Asia, Thailand, it feels really safe. The food's really good. Um, I think it's like the mecca of backpacking and stuff. I I th- it's gonna be our favorite sort of country in Southeast Asia. I feel. Oh yeah, definitely. To live in. Yeah, to live. I don't know. I mean, you know, everywhere has its own charm about it. You know, like Vietnam, some parts of Vietnam I really like. But I don't know what it is. Is it's easier as a tourist here? I feel. Maybe it's because we've been here more. I don't know. But I just there's a certain disconnect when I'm in other like Vietnam or Cambodia. I I don't feel the same. I think also what it is, it's got more money because the tourists tend to come here. So it's it's put the money into. uh, I I mean, I went to Vietnam recently. to Da Nang when I had to I had to leave so I had to leave the country to re-enter on my new visa type when I got my work visa and I don't know it's just like I felt like everyone was out to get me it's like I landed in the airport and there was this oh yeah like, there was this tour company and I I just got off the plane and I, I was just coming across coming up to the immigration lines and I'm just walking uh, across and then suddenly there's just this tribe of like uh like on this chinese tour well, company it's, tour. it's the chinese tours though it's a chinese <laughs> tour company and vietnam are really pushing tiny chinese tourism at the moment and they're offering like visa that like, certain benefits and i've just walked by and this whole this guy's literally having a go at me saying you need to get to the back of the queue because we're on the chinese tour and i was like i don't what care i now? don't care what tour you're on mate and anyway, i'm having an argument with this bloke and the visa, some assi- assistant of this visa tour company has come over and told, in, she speaks very good English, and she's like, you need to move. And I was like, why do I need to move? She's like, well, this is the privilege line. And I went, right. And I said, but the privilege line is over there where you've just signed them in. This is the immigration line. And I've walked here and I'm queuing. And I'm having an argument. Anyway, she then calls an immigration officer over. And I'm like, I, refu- I said, I'm refusing to move. I said, I'm not going anywhere. And then this guy started getting really close to me, like in my face. Like being a like him and his cronies, I was like, I don't care, I'm not moving. Make I said, make me move, and then I think that's when the immigration officer came over, and I thought, oh no, don't tell me I'm going to get arrested here. Um, he's come over and he's like, why are you not moving? And I said, because and I explained the situation. I said, look, I've walked over here. I'm just on a queue. The guy who I was literally sitting next to on the plane, he's already through immigration. He just missed this tribe of people, and then suddenly he goes, look, just come over here. And I thought, oh no, here we go. And then he puts me in the diplomat lane. And he goes, just walk through. And then I turned around and I went, and I just, I just waved at all these people in the queue as they're waiting all the, in this tour as I walk through the diplomat lane with elegance. I, th- I think um, Chinese tours have a reputation yeah. in general in Southeast Asia. I don't know what it is. Any especially chi- in Thailand when yeah. we've come across like Chinese tours. They're, they're very entitled and ro- ro- I don't know what it is because any Chinese person that I've come in contact with on a one on one they're, so, they're nice they're, they're so friendly nice. and you know there's always, but I don't know what it is these people well, I don't know where they find these people in China on these tours but these, these just this arrogant type of person to sort of sum up the episode would we recommend doing the Mei Han Song loop yes should you do it if you don't have any bike experience probably not uh, I don't know if I would have driven it like on my own on my own bike behind Dom because I, d- I feel like I probably would have had an accident if you're not confident on a bike you're probably more inclined to have an accident you have to be quite confident and sort of decisive when you're riding and yeah. Dom is super super in, good in Thailand it's like you there's no time to make a decision you have to you own hesitate. whatever you're going to do and I think Emma can even when she drives a car can hesitate. sometimes hesitate and if driving you're... a car is a different thing here like I feel I feel comfortable driving a car yeah I know because you think you're queen of the road well not necessarily I, I think it's just it feels a lot safer the roads are a lot calmer if you're in a car I feel but you have to watch out for the bikes in northern Thailand I think in northern Thailand it's fine in the south different different story yeah. it, people really drive crazy in the south but in the north of Thailand in a car like totally fine Parking though. Puts That's the me only off. thing. Like, Especially any, driving to the anyone center. you speak to, 
Anyone I've spoken to that lives in Chiang Mai and you tell them that you have a car, they think you're mad. Because yes, when you get round by the Mo and near Taipei Gate or old, the old city, things like that, it's like... So much traffic. The traffic is horrendous and it's bad enough if you're on a bike, let alone when you're stuck in a car. And I I completely get that. And parking, I mean, it's I don't think it's that bad. You can find places, but at the same time it's so much easier when you have a bike because yeah. you can put you can park practically anywhere that's why we did start enjoying having the bike yeah. when the and car was in I the did, garage i have missed it since it's gone because you can just go to any restaurant any shop you want to go to you just gonna park f- up so easily especially like places like central festival when you've got a bike it's like so much easier because there's so many spaces you yeah. always find a space <laughs> in the car oh, i had a bit of a nightmare the other central. day i was just like going around in circles looking for a space basically but, in thailand there's women's parking right for, i couldn't find for it women though. only and, I, and I, emma went to the i thought why don't you go on your own you can use the women's parking it's all great but the problem is a lot of people don't seem to honor the rule of because technically you're not meant to park there even if you're with your partner you or you're like with, a you have woman to be, or, on your women own or, or with, with children but people ignore that and, you know, whatever. And well, the, the, it's not that obvious because they don't have a women's sign. It's just pink in central, anyway. It's yeah. pink and then they have, like, a pink elephant. Or, like, a, a picture a of an elephant. Or a rabbit. No, yeah. rabbit. They have a rabbit sign. Because I told Emma that was where like, the parking was last time. She actually didn't believe me. And then we had to literally go to the information part and ask them. And they told me, point blank, that it was it. Women's. So... If you see a rabbit sign in central and... The space is pink. It's for the women. It's for the ladies. But Emma, for some reason, when she's on her own, she can't find that. I couldn't find more money. it. It's literally. I couldn't find where you go up to the next. I floor. know, but this route we you take in the car box. There's loads of different entrances and exits. But I go in the every time I've been there with Emma. I go the same route every time, and it passes the women's parking every time. But Emma still can't find it. I went a different route, and I've got lost. So in a she's probably car park. spent like the car park so big. Five pounds in petrol, just going, going around, around and around the same floor. She's got a taxi. I couldn't find where you go up to the next floor, so I was just stuck going in circles on the bottom oh, floor. Oh god! <laughs> but I got a space in the end. Um, but yeah, they have women's parking here. You see them at sort of if petrol stations and yeah. like petrol. Yeah, areas. I've seen their service stations. Uh, service stations, and they're always empty. <laughs> yeah, and central. Mm. Um, it's not, it's not that quite busy. common to see the women's only parking, but yeah. in centrals and in... And they have, they have like, different parking for, like, if you have certain credit cards, there's, like, exclusive parking. If you have a fancy supercar, you, you can park if you've got in a the, fancy the car. special spots. I don't know who decides this, because there's this guy, he, again, on TikTok, he's, he's got a fancy car, and he always says this is the, this is the rich people parking. And it, okay, but from what I can gather, it's if you hold this credit card. So that's why when you go by there... You see people in some is, basic cars. It's like they try and encourage people with fancy cars Basically, to go there and they guard your car for you. Yeah, that's all it is. Because <laughs> the, the spaces are bigger and it's right at the front. Yeah. So obviously if you're rich you're more likely gonna spend more. So you should ha- yeah. you should park right at the front. And I think it's this <laughs> it's to set this whole image is such a big thing in Thailand and it sets this whole like lifestyle. So all the peasants walking through the car park. Yeah, you see all these people. And you just see the all these people in their G Wagons and their you know Mercedes and Audis. If you come to Thailand, you will become someone who is very materialistic. Yeah. Because as soon as we got here, we were like, oh, I want to buy that. I want to buy that. Yeah, it makes you... It, the advertising, the people whole... People really... It's sort of like Japan in the way that everyone's very pristine and like... But Western culture is the same. Like, it's, we live in a capitalist society, you know. People, you know, companies are pushing you to buy stuff. It, and no matter where you look, they're trying to push you to buy. But in Thailand, it's like... It's on next the, level. It's the next level. <laughs> You need to buy this. You need then to they, have this. Then they they get you. They like they convince you that you want and it's, to buy these things. It's the free things. stuff. I, it's, they give so much free stuff. And this is how they get you. Oh, but if you spend this amount, you get a free. So like, oh, well. buy this and you get a free this. What and what it, free stuff have we got? We've got two free Amazon chairs. coffee sh- uh, cups, color changing ones. Camping chairs. We've got free camping chair, free bucket Hats. hat. What else? Ba- oh, endless bags. Loads of free I mean, bags. I bought some chicken from the supermarket and they gave me a a, a chicken bag. It's like, Wait, what? Yeah, we, I bought like a uh, chicken breast, and by accident I ordered too much. I think I it, by accident instead of saying a hundred grams, I said a thousand grams. Yeah. So he bought me a kilo of chicken out, that. but because it was like a counter, I, I had to commit to it, and we just, we just had to freeze it and like eat it <laughs> over a so period of time. <laughs> but I got a free bag out of it, and they give you um, oh, it's puppies, and they give you umbrellas and like branded umbrellas if you spend so much. It's all the all the stuff to get you. Yeah, and it works. It definitely works. Oh yeah, Central is a 
is a big because they have this uh, loyalty card. It's called the One Card, and you can get it as a tourist as well. And it gives you like Discounts. if you're a tourist, it gives you like five uh, percent off because of the VAT of the tax so it gives you a tax discount but also you can get the it's like a membership card and you can use it in multiple shops like central and there's all these vouchers and points it's like emma bought some makeup at the store and she oh, went yeah. in for like a nars I, I went to nars and i bought some foundation and and a mascara and then they gave me an extra mascara for free and then two free no, but he, samples he told you to sign up to this thing it was it, it was linked to the one card but it was like a whole it was like a beauty card but mm-hmm. then because she signed up to the beauty card he was throwing in all kinds of stuff and i think i got a discount as well because of the beauty card it's like and there's then, so many freebies i got it, a watch and they gave me a free bracelet yeah. but they must factor this into their you know into their how they price everything to be able to do that but it's still it it works it's because it's just so cheap to for them to buy this extra stuff that they just like yeah. have a freebie. But yeah, so if you're if you don't know, we have a, a Patreon uh, for our channel, which I'm hoping if you're listening to the podcast, you're aware that we have a channel. But if you don't, <laughs> we have a YouTube channel called Always Away, where we've been traveling around Japan, Europe, and now yeah. we're based in Thailand. We're showing a lot of our Thai, Thailand based content as well as our mini series we've just completed of the Mei Hong Song Loop so if you are listening and you haven't seen those videos check them out and there's also behind the scenes stuff from that series on our Patreon and monthly live streams we just did our first but, one the other day yeah, it was meant to be 45 minutes but it was 3 hours <laughs> 3 hours uh, yeah it was fun talking to Christy and Isabella and the username is called Jersey Traveller yeah. somehow. and at one point we had more Patreons on there than no we had more viewers than Patreons yeah, so I, I was like know. oh hold on who's been sharing but yeah it was but fun yeah. hanging out on the live stream but yeah it's just going to be able to make us help us improve our content being able to buy things like microphone arms and armchairs mm. and all the lighting that you can't see it but we we're trying to invest into the channel so yeah it really and we want to keep the channel going because it's this last week we, i've felt a bit down in the dumps about growing content. the channel it's it's hard to get your videos out there and i did a poll on instagram about like do you want a podcast episode about why it's so hard to grow a channel and loads of people said they would be interested in it so that's definitely something we're gonna sit down and and it will be on the podcast but it's hard it's a hard subject to. because you don't want to come across as your moaning moaning or like because there are a lot of there are negatives when you are making content especially at the start where it's like the never-ending journey it just what it feels like anyway. so, yeah and putting out a lot of time into videos and not really seeing any numbers or it i don't know there's like, no growth at the moment on our channel because we just seem to be losing people we're, losing we're gaining but then we're losing uh yeah maybe we shouldn't put this in at the end because it's not good to end on a negative note no, no, I think, um, but yeah, I want to do a podcast episode about it, just showing you like the real side of what it's like to As try a travel and, content creator to try and make a YouTube channel because I feel like a lot of people aren't open and honest about it, and yeah. I feel like it's really important. And I'm sure a lot of you listening probably have thought about starting your own channel, doing your own thing, and I mean we did for years before we even mm. started, and there's so much you don't see or yeah. like. Like the emotional roller coaster of doing YouTube and yeah. trying to. There's so um, many people with such good com- quality so much videos competition. out there. There's mm. so much. There's so many other channels. So it's like, how do you stand out? How so. do you grow? Or if, you know, the algorithms working against you. Like we've got a lot of, we've got a lot we could talk about in showing like what we're going through and what it's actually like. Not just the ups, the downs. The as YouTube well. diaries. But also, yeah. if you're interested mm. in anything that we can do in in thailand we've been trying to think of like a series or a challenge we could do i really like to do a challenge i mean we yeah. thought about doing like cycling across thailand but it's too hot. the air is horrific it's too hot mm. and percy doesn't work as well we've got the dog and it would just be a nightmare um so if you can think of a challenge we could do yeah but we're also looking to focus on the podcast about other people's travel stories because we've spoken a lot about our own and i mean we have endless so we're not short on that but we are looking to we want to hear your hear stories, your basically. stories. So if you could email us in, if you could we take the time at alwaysawaypodcast at gmail dot com. So we've made that email for submissions. It'd be great. We've had a couple of people um, yeah, emails come through, which we're going to read. 
Yeah, cause we did get we we've we've got some stories sent in, but we're just waiting for a few more, and then we're gonna start going through them on episodes and giving our take and maybe our yeah. experiences that relate to the stories. Yeah. And yeah, it'd be fun to hear from you guys and shout you out on the podcast. Yeah. Thank Eloquent you, Thank you, Mark, for sending in your story, which we'll, we will talk mm. about. It's in, written beautifully. In an upcoming episode. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, check us out on Instagram. Check out our Patreon. Check out our channel. But for now, we're always away. See, See you in the, the next, next one. one. Bye. Bye. Yeah.